Good morning, everyone. Now, if you took a look at your bulletin, you notice that things are a little bit different today. If you're a visitor and you want to go through what we normally do, show them next week. The regular members, we mix things up a little bit in honor of, of Billy. You know, um, she nurtured a great many of us. Actually, I should say she mothered him most of us. Um, and yesterday we had her service, her memorial service, and I think most of us are still a little bit overcome with that. And that's why we have a special program we give today of dealing with grief. And that's why we have changed up our program somewhat. Um, Heidi Jeff John will be in, in the public. Uh, she found Christ at a very, very age, five, I believe she said. Uh, she has many degrees, you can read some of them in the bulletin. Uh, but she'll do a good job. Uh, some of our members. <laughs> 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 okay, she's going to do a crappy job. <laughs> 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 okay, so, um, it, it's going to be, a, it's, in some ways, it'll be a difficult service today. Um, as a worship leader, as I said yesterday, I always stand up there in the pulpit. And the person I look to uh, is not going to be there. And she's not, she was there for years, ever since I started here. And ever since a lot of people started here. Billy was always there. But as I said, she was always there for all. Um, and in light of that, we have a lot of leftovers from yesterday's service. So instead of scallying out the front door, please join us in the fellowship hall. We've got sandwiches and a lot of other leftovers. We would appreciate it. Uh, if you wait, I know that the family would appreciate it. We have several announcements today that are not in your bulletin. I'm going to start off here with John Moore, and after John, I'm going to have the fourth, Gary and Susan. Oh, yeah, very good. Uh, good morning. Uh, on behalf of the Mission Action Team, uh, I'd like to uh, once again announce, and I think most of you are aware of it, that we have a coat drive coming up that's uh, actually sponsored by the Parks and Lives, and we've always supported that big time. It's on the 14th and 15th of this month. Uh, set up on the 14th and the actual distribution of uh, winter gear on the 15th. So if you still have anything at home that's, mm, it's, you know, it's been kind of dusty, you don't use it anymore, and that could be anything from a coat to scarves to mittens to caps, whatever. Bring it in. We've got uh, uh, boxes uh, both in the North Arts and in the Fellowship Hall uh, for reflecting those for distribution. Thank you. Now I am building these grounds here in the Are you building the grounds? <laughs> 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 I'm, I'm Susan Smart, that's Gary Porch. Mm -hmm. We're on the committee. Um, so we're we're going to announce that we're going to do a really neat project. We're going to remodel and renovate the Sunday school room. That includes carpeting and uh, texturing and painting, uh, lighting fixtures, right? Here? Lighting fixtures. Okay. So that's going to start on November 25th, which is Thanksgiving week. And uh, the Friday before, which is uh, November 22nd, we're going to start uh, moving stuff out of the Sunday school rooms. So we would, anybody want to help uh, bring boxes or show up? It's going to be Sue Grant. Sue Grant will be the contact person for that. And uh, it should be maybe a couple, three hours. Uh, we're going to take everything out of those rooms we can. We're going to put them in the gymnasium. And also, too, if any of your groups have any activities that week, um, we're pretty sure that we've covered the bases to let everybody know. Um, we have one group that will come in on Tuesday, but they'll meet in the social hall. 
So if you had any plans or activities, make sure you let us know. We think we've covered that. Yeah. So we need boxes again and bodies on the 22nd, 9.30 till 2. Um, bring a lunch if you want. But anyway, any, anybody that can help would be great. Cheryl, do you have a question? Uh, will there be Sunday school on the 24th? Uh, Carol's going to move everybody into, yes, there will be Sunday school on the 24th, but Carol's going to move everybody into the uh, Mark Richards Hall, or she'll relocate, so she knows. And then, um, one last thing, if anyone feels a calling to donate towards this project, we do have it in our budget, but we'd like to keep those funds, that buildings and grounds, is that you, grounds? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> funded? Yes. And so we... And if you have any a project in particular you're interested in, you can talk to us or, or Bill or Carolyn, and, and we can move forward. If you want to be the be the starter on a project, you know, and, and then we can move it forward with you, and you can help us with it. Um, we also like to say thank you. Uh, we can't say, mention everybody's name, but you know, in the year uh, this past year, so many things have uh, people have contributed their time and their effort, their money, especially their effort in getting things fixed around here, getting things done, getting the grounds cleaned up, getting uh, uh, things upgraded, repairs. And uh, I mean, if you start thinking of who those people are and the list is very long. And uh, I'd just like to say it's been great to be, uh, always have that uh, energy and that fuel of all the help of you people helping us out. Thank you very much. There's a lot going on behind the scenes, and Gary Porch does a whole lot of it. So without a whole lot of recognition, and we don't really know, but all of a sudden he shows up and the project's been done. Like, well, that's because Dale always calls me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Anyway, so I think that's it. Anything else? That's good. Okay. Good. Thanks. Right. <laughs> oh, I just wanted to note, in case you were wondering what we were playing. Uh, we started out with Jesus, Jesus, Rest Your Hand, which is actually a Christmas carol. Um, and will be on our program December 15th, which I hope all of you are going to attend because it will be really good. Um, and if you are looking forward to P.A. Yesu, we are not playing that. We are now going to play Beautiful to say here. So uh, I just wanted to thank that. Let's prepare our hearts and minds to worship God.
Thank you to our bell choir. It was beautiful this morning. There's one other announcement I had to make, and I'm going to make it right now. Um, if you look at your bulletin, you'll see an asterisk. That means stand up. <laughs> now, I'm not, I'm not going to be, I'm going to be up here and I'm going to forget to say whatever. So when you see that asterisk, just stand up. <laughs> like right now, stand up. <laughs> and, and join me in the call of worship. Our help is in the name of the Lord who makes heaven and earth. With true and believing hearts, let us worship and give praise to God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And now please join me standing for our song of praise.
usually what happens when this event occurs, mom or dad of that of the child of this one comes up and tries to put it back in balance. It's not working too well, is it? Okay, well then let's have one of the kids come up here and help dad, who's probably staying home. You got the picture? Grief goes all the way down. Not only has the patriarch died, but that this generation lost a parent. So there's a heaviness in that family. Then the next generation down here has lost the patriarch and the functioning of that parent that's helping the senior. And they're left in the, under the control of, we hope, a nice sibling that doesn't use the power that they have. So this is your typical family in grief. Add to that the friends, the extra family, the cousins, etc. And you've got a whole bunch of people hurting over one person's death. Um, it's, it's a natural event. We know it's going to happen and we don't talk about it. And I want to say grief has nothing to do with faith. Our faith is what we are grieving is the loss of love. We are not uh, disavowing our faith. We have to walk through that grief. So at Mount Calvary, we have three ways that we have found efficient in this and helpful. We have the Grief Share Group, which is a plug and play type of program with DVDs, workbooks, and group discussions. And then we have Emmaus Journey, which is a little more, a lot more free flowing. There's no structure to it. We come in, we hold hands, we pray, and we walk through what's the stumbling block this week. I overcame that last week. And we recognize the grief is forever. Yes, it does soften. Yes, it does lighten up a bit. And we get sandbagged. Um, I talk about after my father died, and it was some months later, right? probably about 18 months, and I'm in Stater Brothers Market, and I'm looking at the tomatoes, and I'm crying because not because I love tomatoes, because I love them. Yeah, I do, sort of, but because my dad taught me how to fix fried tomatoes the Todd way, and all of a sudden this washed over me. Um, I can talk about it because I'm okay with it, and it happens again when I'm holding my grandchildren, and my dad died in 1989, and all of a sudden, the tears well up because I wish he was there. The grief turns into a very poignant missing and a wistfulness. And we learn to walk with it. The best way to walk with it is to lean into it and honor the love that produced it. The only people who do not grieve are those who do not love. And quite frankly, I'd rather struggle with the grief than to be unloving and unlovable. Um, it takes time. There's no getting over it. It's like an amputee. We don't say, well, you got over the loss of your leg. You got a new one? No, it's, you know, that's gone. And I will get a prosthesis. I will have other friends that can be father figures. But the initial part of me is gone. And the friends that I have, this is what we teach at Mount Calvary, is the support network. God gives us consolation. I know where my parents are. And on Mother's Day, it is my friends that come and say, yeah, I miss my mom too. Wow, and then we start telling stories. And that's the healing part. Um, there's a, this is sort of a commercial plug, because there's uh, sort of because there's no money attached to this. If you are interested in doing a grief support ministry here, I would love to show you what we do and to encourage you. My goal, my dream, would be every church on the mountain has its own 
grief support network so that they can be of comfort to their, their own parishioners, their own friends. People don't know me. You know, uh, say, well, you can go to that church. No, how about coming to this one? Yeah, why not? Anyway, thank you again for the time. And I have uh, information back there on a, a flyer, a sheet of paper. And I will take my family. <laughs> Blessed day. Thank you. <laughs>
two things, right? It compares opposites. And one opposite is something really bad, right? Like being crying or sad or bored or destroying <coughs> things. But then the other opposite is something really good, right? And so this, this verse teaches us something really good. It teaches us that life is like a circle, right? That if something bad happens, what's going to happen next? Something good will happen. Right? Yeah, we continue in this circle, just like the seasons, right? Yeah. And so we know. Now, wait, wait. So what is grief? Now, if I tell you the opposite of grief, do you think you can tell me what grief is? Yeah. The opposite of grief would be overjoy. Yeah, joy. Happiness, what's another, what would be the opposite of joy and happiness? <coughs> yeah, crying, it's deep sadness, right? So the opposite of joy is grief. Does that help you understand what grief is? Yeah, yeah do you understand what grief is? <laughs> yeah. And so, so grief is something we fear because we feel so much joy, right? Very good. Okay, everybody, let's say the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
creation and printed in your blood. God, our Savior, as we hear your word, send your Holy Spirit to be our teacher of faith and truth, and show us how we are called to live through Jesus Christ our Lord. this morning are from both the Old Testament as well as the New. We'll start with Psalm 42, uh, also known as Longing for God and His Help in Distress. My tears have been my food day and night, while people say to me continually, Where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I went with the throng and led them in procession to the house of God. With glad shouts and songs of thanksgiving, a multitude keeping festival. And from the Gospel according to John, these excerpts. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. Mary was the one who anointed the Lord with perfume and wiped his feet with her hair. Her brother Lazarus was ill. So the sisters sent a message to Jesus. Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. Mary came where Jesus was and saw him. She knelt at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. He said, Where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus began to weep. From the letter of Paul to the Romans, marks of the true Christian. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but give yourselves to humble tasks. Do not claim to be wiser than you are. Good morning. Stressed, 
or confused, those are the defaults when we haven't quite sorted things out. Sadness, then, is one of our four core feelings. Sadness, put in a more formal word, formal word is grief. And we are grieved because we have lost something. The most obvious meaning being, being the death of a person. There are, though, a huge number of other kinds of losses, including declining health, retirement, marital disappointment, career dissatisfaction, financial problems, betrayal or rejection by a friend, kids not turning out the way we would like, personal moral failure, friends moving away, or kids launching from the nest. That's my most recent one. <laughs> the list just goes on and on. Grief, then, due to loss, is ubiquitous. Someone in my life recently said to me, I don't think I can handle one more bad thing. Yet within a couple weeks in that person's life, they heard of two deaths and someone else who was having a major health crisis. Like waves on the ocean, life with its sorrows just keeps rolling in. As a wise client of mine shared with me, everyone is going through something. So as we travel within the maze of grief, grief we can feel lost, alone, and confused. We might feel that the bottom has dropped out of our worlds and there is no map to guide us in this grieving. The question then is, what has Jesus got to do with all this pain? No matter what, the good news remains that Jesus gets us. He, he was known as a man of sorrows. He has been there, done that. He was acquainted with grief. We've all likely had the experience of walking in a Catholic church where the crucifix is placed boldly, it's front and center with Jesus bleeding on the cross, thus never letting the believers forget about his suffering, continuously reminding them of Jesus' death. One of our scripture passages today included the shortest verse of the Bible, Jesus wept. This was Jesus' response after finding out that his dear friend Lazarus had died. Jesus wept even though he foreknew he would soon raise Lazarus from the dead. As Christian songwriter Michael Card's song bellows out about Jesus, he will be known by his scars. Those scars were actually the only way that Jesus' friend and follower, known as Doubting Thomas, was able to verify that Jesus had, had truly resurrected. It was by touching the scars in his hands and on his side. So God knows what it is like to hurt when dealing with pain. Brother Curtis Almquist, who is part of the Society of St. John the Evangelist, is quoted as saying, You will face death many a time in this life, and that is the very cross that Jesus is sharing with you. So now let's go back to Charlie Brown with his saying, good grief. How can we experience that? Time heals all things, the old adage goes. Yet Dr. A.C. Grant stated that time without the work of grieving isn't enough. She's identified myths of grief. These include things like, when grief is resolved, it will never come up again. Because you feel crazy, you really are going crazy. <laughs> you should feel only sadness when your loved one has died. And there's something wrong with you if you don't feel close to your family and friends while you're grieving. Most of us have heard of Kubler-Ross's stages of grief. There's shock and denial, depression, bargaining, anger, and acceptance. Yet these no longer are considered stages that we have to go through one at a time, rather themes within the grieving experience. Other authors have also described the experience of grief as including loneliness with isolation. It has, we can often have physical symptoms of distress or pain. We can also experience guilt due to regrets and resentment. Many people are trying to cope with grief frequently just by aiming to distract themselves, sometimes with excessive involvements, sometimes getting to the point of addictions. 
we often seek to ignore or suppress our feelings. Yet in trying to manage our emotions in a healthy way, there is some advice out there that people have given. Dr. William Wharton, who I trained underneath at Rosemead School of Psychology, formulated the task of grief as, accept the reality of loss, identify and express feelings, adjust to the environment that the deceased is missing, withdraw emotional energy from the deceased, and reinvest in other outlets. An anonymous person put forward the grief's bill of rights, which includes, number one, you have the right to experience your own unique grief. You have the right to talk about your grief. You have the right to feel a multitude of emotions. You have the right to experience grief attacks. And you have the right to be tolerant of your own physical and emotional limits. A simplistic vantage point is that grief recovery consists of a two-point, two-part process. Mourning our loss and keeping going with life. Like a bicycle or an elliptical exercise machine, we keep balance by moving one leg and then the other. We do our grieving with loss-focused work, then oscillating with life-focused work. The hope is that concepts like these may provide some guidance as we navigate our particular loss. Well, let's get it together, right? So like seatbelts need to be connected to be of any good, so we as people need to be connected to one another to get us to the good grief. This togetherness was the way that Jesus commanded us to be. As part of the body of Christ, we are literally Jesus' hands and feet. Jesus asked us to continue on with his, with his ministry by giving us the Holy Spirit and wanting us to be in his one another club. Love one another bear with one another, forgive one another, it goes on and on, right? An additional one another to distinguish his followers, the church, was weep with those who weep. We enter into each other's, we, we are to enter into each other's lives to such extent that we are there for one another. Like military personnel say, I've got your back. We here at LACPC have as part of our name that this is a community church. We are connected with each other. Just as the Holy Spirit's name is paraclete, meaning to come alongside, we also are to come alongside among those who are hurting. Sidney Zissuk, an MD, simplifies our ministry into three H's. Hush, don't say much. Hug and hang out. Just be around. Now for a couple of side points. As a psychotherapist, it's important for me to point out that some people may benefit from personal counseling and medication to help cushion them through the roughness of their loss. The stats are that approximately 10% of people who are experiencing a major depression have lost someone within that year. Also, it's good to mention that grief, grieving can frequently take longer than we might expect. This is especially true when the person who left us was close to us in what could be labeled as our circle of care. I learned a long time ago in graduate school that the average amount of time while grieving a death of an intimate can take 18 months. This though is the average with, with a large number of people taking up to three years to grieve still being well, well within the normal range. I've heard people say that sometimes it's the second year after the death can, that can be particularly difficult because others around them expect them to sort of get back into normal life and they're not always ready to do so. The last two points. Growth can come through grieving. As Dorothy in The Wizard of Oz puts it, Toto, I'm having the feeling that we're not in Kansas anymore. Grieving people are getting, aren't getting back into the stream of life in the same place where they left off. They have grown through the grieving. They have shifted due to their experience and will actually never be the same again. Quoting Dr. A.C. Grant again, 
She stated that as you pull together sh the shattered pieces of your life, your identity will be in a revised, different configuration. As someone put it, there will be new life even, th even though I will always bear the marks of my grief. We previously mentioned that Jesus had permanent scars, to say the least, right, after his traumatic death of dying on the cross for us. The Apostle Paul told us that he had a thorn in the flesh. This is from 2 Corinthians 12, 7. Literally then, don't we all carry around the scars or the thorns in our flesh and our souls due to the losses which we have endured? God grasp us. Psalm, Psalm 18, 17, the verse says, He reached down on high and gripped me. Jesus has a hold of us. He won't, we won't always have to deal with all this pain. We have hope that in the end, we will get relief. We are promised a good ending if we cling to the cross of Jesus. We are told that in heaven, he will, hide, he will wipe away every tear from our eyes. And we can hardly wait for that to be realized. We shall always be with the Lord, essentially the definition of heaven. It equals together with Jesus, the God who consistently loves us. In conclusion, we all weep when life's mystery of twist and turn turns includes a loss of family, friend, health, or relationship. Yet Jesus will comfort us now through the Holy Spirit, reaching through his people and his creation until we get to the ultimate cuddling with Christ at the end of this life's journey. Before God, with all the people of God, tell, let us confess our brokenness, or make room for healing. Let us pray. Almighty God, you have shown us the way of justice and nurtured us with love. Even so, we have not lived according to your will. When we are oppressed or unjustly accused, we claim to fear and forget to trust in your deliverance. When we are giddy with power and abuse the rights of others, we hold tight to our privilege and forget your laws. Have mercy on us, Lord, for we are weak and prone to disturbance. Hear now our silent prayers of confession. Respond to us with kindness, that we might turn to you again, walk in the light, and live in equal peace. Through Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Amen. This is God's promise, the sign, the seal of your redemption. We have been called by God, claimed in Christ, and set free through the Holy Spirit. Believe this good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God.
name is Angela Hill, and uh, I was asked to share some of my faith walk, and um, I prayed a lot about it, and God kept telling me that, you know, we're grieving over Billy, and we're grieving over other things in our lives, a lot of um, illness, whatever, but the one thing that God kept saying is, Angela, God is the comfort. God is the comfort. The more we go to God, the more comfort we get. And so um, God asked me, um, encouraged me to, uh, to, sorry, wrong page. Encouraged me to um, share this one story from my life with you. It's a little difficult, it's a grief story, but it also ends with God being there for me. So, um, uh, many years ago, I was standing in the front of the church praying along with others. I was rejoicing in God's presence and glory. Afterward, I turned around and a lady was standing in front of me. She said to me, you want to be like Jesus? And I said, yes. <laughs> she then began to tell me a list of Jesus' life, including he um, was rejected, he was betrayed, he was disliked, he was tortured, he was killed, he was hurt, he lived in poverty, he was misunderstood, and on she went. And then she looked me in the eye and said, do you still want to be like Jesus? And with God's spirit, I said yes. And she said, then you will be. Well, I had never seen her before and never have since. I got married later that year. In April, during prayer, God told me I was going to learn about love. I was so excited. I was thrilled. Meanwhile, my husband turned from the most gentle, loving, caring man that I had ever met to the most angry, violent man I had ever met. Daily life was torture. Meanwhile, I was thinking I'm supposed to be learning about love. Okay, God's love. Um, my husband would throw me across the room so I would hit furniture and end up on the floor hurt. Remember, I was trying to learn God's love, so I would bake him brownies afterwards and forgive him. Um, I was trying to do everything I could according to what the Bible told me. One day, I was singing while doing the dishes. He didn't like the song I was singing, so he grabbed me and threw me into the table and chairs. I was lying on the floor crying, and he stood over me and smiled. My mind filled with rage. I wanted to take a knife and stick him with it and turn it. Just at that moment, God flooded my mind with a vision of Jesus laying on the ground while soldiers hammered nails into his hands. They were smiling. God said, I love them at that moment, Angie. I was overwhelmed with the, love, the depth of God's love and I realized that God loves me no matter what I'm going through. I was not going to be like Jesus, I was going to learn the depth of love that God had for me and all people. It profoundly changed my life and my relationship with God. Since then, each April, God gives me a word for what I'll be learning that year. I've gone through a lot of grief and hardship over the years while I learned those lessons. But one thing I can tell you is that God has always been there to comfort me. And it's always when I turn to Him, I get the comfort that I need. Blessed are those who mourn, because they will be comforted. God, the divine giver, <clears throat> gives us the light and breath and all that is in gratitude. Let us offer our gifts in return for the goodness and grace of God in Christ. <clears throat> Thank you. 
Brother in law's chair. So the prayers of the people are that either the person was mentioned has passed or is ill, and that these people that came up are hurting, and we hope as a congregation we would be the body of Christ and reach out to those people who are hurting within our congregation.
just promising transformation and a relationship with God along the way. And let all the people say, Amen. Peace of Christ be with you. Let us share that peace. Thank <laughs> you.